as we look to you this morning, begging you for forgiveness. We pray for DCC this morning, God. We pray for our visiting friends who are with us this morning. Father God, as a, as a praise group, we thank you for the opportunity that we have that we can stand here and lead your people into worship. We can't thank you enough. Be with us as we go through the rest of this service. And that everything is said and done will be done to the honor and to the glory to your most holy name. We love you so much. As we take the emblems that symbolizes everything to us as Christians, your body, your blood spilt and broke for every single one of us in here this morning, Father God. We say thank you. And as we take it and as we, we take a moment and to reflect and we, and we picture your body there for us, broken for us. Lead us into your presence at this time. And as Brother Derek comes with us this morning, give him words from on high. Let him speak to his, let him, let him speak to, to DCC. Let him speak to your people this morning. And when the time is no more here in this earth, take us home with you, please. We long to go home with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning again, DCC. That is a hard act to follow right there, our worship team. Let's give them another big round of applause. My name is Rachel. And my name is Kyra. And we are part of the host team here at DCC. And we just want to take this opportunity to welcome you this morning. We are so glad you have decided to join us on this winter or February morning. It's a little chilly outside, <laughs> yeah. isn't it, Kyra? All right, we are continuing our series today, Win the Day. Today, our message is entitled, Fly the Kite. Sometimes it's about the little things that make us successful and that, that make us feel accomplished. It's not always the big goals that we can check off that piece of paper, right? It's sometimes just those little things. So that's what we're going to learn about today, Fly the Kite. And I don't know about you guys, but I can't wait until spring to fly that kite. So excited. So, of course, we have a new app. If you have not downloaded that, it is so awesome, and it is so easy to do everything. You can give your offering online. You can contact any of us, any of your pastors or anything like that, and you can just see all the messages from previous times, from previous Sundays, anything like that. It is so awesome, and 
any of us can help you with guest services out there too. So definitely a great way to keep informed about things going on yeah. in the church, Kyra. Great, great job. Okay. Also, we are um, talking about that next step this morning. And I, I just thought of something this morning and, and Kyra doesn't even know I'm going to say this, but this was Kyra's next step, joining the host team and being up here in front of you all. And if you've ever been on this stage, you know that it's incredibly difficult when you're looking out at all of you and making sure that we say the right things and, and make the message or, you know, go in, going into the message and making sure that everything ties together, right? But this was Kyra's next step, and it's easy here at DCC. Our mission is simple. Love God, love people, make disciples. And whether you know it or not, each morning when you accept us on this stage and you help us and you help Kyra and you support Kyra, that is continuing her faith and continuing growing both of our faiths, really, right? Yeah. And so just just keep that in mind when you want to take that next step. Maybe it's not getting on this stage, but maybe it's just joining a group or um, praying with someone or making that profession of faith. So we want you to be comfortable to talk to us and, and just ask. Just ask what you can do to take your next step here at DCC. I'm sure glad I made my next step, and I know Kyra is too. Yes, thank you. And I love getting up here each and every Sunday. I mean, it just makes me, I just really love it. So um, now all of our Abana Land and, well, our Upstreet kids can uh, meet Miss whoever will be at the door. <laughs> Miss Mandy will be at the door today. <laughs> and um, if you are going to Upstreet, please um, let your kids use their mask on um, while they go up there. So. And today, um, we are so excited to be continuing our, with Derek, we are so happy to have him back and that he is feeling pretty better, <laughs> and um, so we'll go ahead and pray and get into his message, so please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together and praise you, dear Lord, and just hear the message that Derek has bringing us and that he will just really, that it will really sink into all of us and that we will really feel it and just know what to do with you, dear Lord. Just help us, he will help us, God, God us in your path, dear Lord. We love you and thank you for all the wonderful, wonderful blessings that you have given us, like the opportunity to come here and just a roof over our heads and everything, dear Lord. We just want to please keep everybody safe during this hard time and just please keep on blessing us with all the amazing things that you have already blessed us, dear Lord. And just please help the lost and help them follow you, dear Lord. Amen. Once again, good morning. Come on, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. I know that it's a cold, wintry day out there, but uh, we're here, and uh, I'm excited about being able to step back into this series with you today. Before I do, though, I want to say thanks to everybody. Thank you for the calls and the text messages and uh, just everything, the prayers, for some of you for the food and, and for the care packages and things of that nature while I was away last week, sick with this, uh, this virus. And, uh, but luckily, fortunately for me and, and for, for others of you that I've talked with now, you know, our symptoms, some of us were mild, but others that we're talking about and, and we're thinking about and praying for in our community right now, uh, it's not the case. And, and so uh, having this and being through this, of course, has, has put me in a, in a different perspective with even some right now in our church that are uh, battling COVID right now. And I just ask that you continue your prayers uh, for them as well and finding out if there's anything that you can do to help them during this time because quarantine is nothing to mess with, right? Uh, we, we found that out. Now, one other thing, though, I want to say that being able to step back into this series, uh, I need to say a special thank you, and I think all of us should be grateful for a few men last week that were able to put everything together for service, and that is uh, Greg Neat, our elder here at DCC, and Alex Rexroth, our worship director, and Michael Tucker, who was able to put everything together, our upstreet director, and all three of them did a fabulous job. Give them a hand because they stepped in there. 
in a mighty, mighty way. And uh, so I'm really grateful for those, those fellows and for all of you that uh, continue to help and to serve and to make things happen here at DCC. Thank you so much. Uh, but today, we get to jump back into this series. And this series is based on a book written by Mark Batterson, a pastor from Washington, D.C. It's an incredible book that we're using kind of the skeleton outline of the book in order to bring about some messages for us, you know, in learning what it means to win the day. Because when we started off 2021, let's be honest, we wanted it to be nothing like 2020, right? And we wanted to make sure that we would win in 2021, even though sometimes, you know, in 2020, it just felt like life sometimes was, was going so many different directions. But in order to win the year, you need to start by winning the day. And when we win the day, what we'll actually find is that we have an opportunity to win at life. When we give each and every day the attention that it deserves, and we live our lives in such a way that what we're talking about here and what we're defining win the day as is that we live our lives in such a way that we glorify God by following Jesus. That's how we defined win the day, to glorify our heavenly Father by living our lives and following the examples of Jesus. And so we've been looking throughout Scripture, of course, as we do every week, to look at the words and the commands of Jesus and the example that he gives us to follow. And if we will live our lives in this fashion, we will ultimately fulfill what it is that we need to fulfill in living our lives to glorify our heavenly Father. As Rachel said, by loving God, by loving people, and ultimately by making disciples which is the mission that we, of course, have been given. Now, today, the, new, the next habit that we're jumping into is what we're calling fly the kite. Fly the kite. Now, we're not telling anybody to go fly a kite, okay? That's, that's not what this means. But we're talking about fly the kite. And this story or this habit originates in a story, uh, kind of obscure, something from history, actually, uh, of a story about Niagara Falls. So bear with me just a minute as I, as I share this with you. In the mid-1800s, the only way to cross the Niagara Gorge, which was an 800-foot-long span that uh, you know, included uh, uh, rapid water, you know, water with lots of rapids that ended up in a, in a water fall, as you know, in Niagara Falls, uh, was by a boat. And that's the only way you could cross from the United States to Canada in this, in this gorge, in this area across the, the Niagara uh, area here. But in the mid-1800s, uh, they wanted more. And they commissioned an engineer to find a way to build a suspension bridge from one end of uh, the, the Niagara River, I guess that's what that is, or that area, that gorge, from one side to the other. And this engineer was faced with a, with a really big situation. I mean, 800 feet wide, and on both sides, uh, there were cliffs of over 200 feet tall. And so he, he got together a group of people, and he had them kind of brainstorm ideas about how they can begin the process of building a suspension bridge across this gorge. And in fact, it's not just any suspension bridge, not just something for you to walk across, but it was so that a locomotive could pass over top of the gorge. They thought about all sorts of ways, maybe by rocket, maybe by cannon, and they had some other ideas as well, but what they settled on so, so weird here, is to have a kite flying contest. That's right, you heard me. In order to build a bridge, the engineer started with a kite flying contest. And in fact, it was a 15-year-old teenage boy from America who was able to use the prevailing winds of this Niagara region to fly his kite from one side to the other. And in doing so, they were able to tie the kite string on both sides of this gorge. The next day, they were able to attach a rope to that kite string and pull it across the 800-foot span. The next day, or the following day, they were able to t attach a metal cable onto that rope and pull it across the Niagara Gorge. And then the following days, you know, larger and larger rope until they had a strand of 36 cables that they were pulling across the Niagara Gorge. It was an incredible thing. And all because of a kite string a suspension bridge that could hold the weight of a locomotive traveling with all sorts of goods was created here at the Niagara Gorge. This is a historical uh, drawing or, or painting of this. You can kind of see what's going on here. This was an incredible feat. I mean, think about it. Do you think that 15-year-old boy had any idea that his kite flying success would end up a suspension bridge spanning over 800 feet and 200 feet in the air. Pretty impressive, isn't it? The same thing is true about our lives. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about fly the kite, looking at the little things of life. And in fact, let me give you a, a biblical kind of foundation to this, not just with this story, but there was a similar situation in the lives of the Israelites. 
Many of you probably are familiar that because of their disobedience at times, God would allow foreign invaders to enter into Jerusalem and to, to sack the temple and, and to take the people away. And in one such time, uh, outside invaders totally destroyed the temple. But years later, if you're familiar with the stories of uh, Nehemiah and the book of Ezra and those, those stories, then you know that the Israelites, the, the, the Jewish people, were able to go back to their city and rebuild their temple. And one such man who was considered to be the governor of the area and given the charge to rebuild the temple was named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel was going to accomplish a great task, but it wasn't because of his own power or his own might. In fact, God, speaking through the prophet Zechariah, speaks to Zerubbabel and to the people of Israel, explaining something very similar to the situation we find with the Niagara Gorge. Here's what the book of Zechariah tells us, just to lay a little foundation for what we're talking about today. Zechariah 4, chapter 4, verse 6. Then he said to me, and this is Zechariah saying that the Lord's speaking to him. This is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And what he's talking about is this temple that I'm saying that is going to be built and everything you're going to accomplish in, in your life and be successful for the kingdom of God. God is telling Zerubbabel and telling Zechariah to tell the people it's not going to be based on your own abilities, right? And as Christ followers, we understand this, that we live with the spirit of God within us and that same spirit was the same spirit that accomplished so much as we see throughout history and throughout the lives of mankind. In fact, what Zechariah says the Lord tells him as he continues with verse 7 it is incredible. He says that even the mighty mountains, think about this, the mighty mountain cannot stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And this is God again saying mighty things are going to be done. Great things are going to be accomplished. Big things you are going to be successful at. And I love this point that, that not even a mighty mountain will stand in his way. I, I think a lesson from this that I heard a pastor say one time is that, you know, sometimes we spend a lot of time speaking to God and, and we have to start there. But sometimes we default to that without doing anything on our own and, and, and living out the truths that God gives to us and says about us and the faithfulness that we are supposed to show as well. And instead of always just asking God to do it, sometimes he empowers us. We need to be speaking to the mountain. And, hey, mountain, you better be ready to move because God's doing a big thing through us and for us, and with us. But even a mighty mountain will be a plain before Zerubbabel and before his people. And then he continues, verse 7, and he says, And when Zerubbabel then, the final stone of the temple, sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. And this is God prophesying, saying, look, I'm telling you that this is going to take place. Zerubbabel is going to lay the final stone of the temple, and he will start this as well. He says, Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. That's the promise. That's where we start in this. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Zechariah is saying, God is, is wanting to prove to you that he is faithful and he is true but there's something hidden in this that is so amazing. He's talking to a group of people that the, the temple has not even been built yet. And many of them maybe have doubts and have concerns about this. And they wonder if it's really going to happen. I mean, God's promising it. But, but is it really going to take place? I mean, look, even the temple was built smaller than it was before. And a lot of people were upset about that. But God said, don't worry about that. I'm going to do big things through this temple and through my people. In fact, here's what he says in the next verse. Do not despise these small beginnings. Nothing really much had taken place yet. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Nothing had even really taken place yet. Just some foundation stones had been set. No construction of the temple itself had taken place. And already, look at this, the Lord is rejoicing to see even the work begin. And that's the point. Faithful in the small things faithful in the beginning to, to put ourselves out there to be obedient and to be used by God. The Lord rejoices, and I love this, to see the plumb line, you know, and of course this is used to begin the construction process for, for buildings, and at this time in ancient times, we get a lot of modern technology now, but this plumb line, this string with this weight on the bottom, and it would, it would hold to be true, you know, with, with the earth and gravity, and it would help to set a level for everything. 
And so I started thinking about it. This is kind of a statement I came up with. A plumb line or a kite string, same difference. Do not despise small beginnings. Do not despise the beginnings of a project when it seems that things, maybe nothing has even taken place yet because as we learn in this story, the Lord rejoices even in the small things. He rejoices in the obedience at the beginning even of the project before anything great has taken place. This idea of the Lord rejoicing over something so minute, right? Something so mundane, something so small. We call this a disproportionate celebration. Disproportionate celebration. This is when not much has been done, but there is a massive celebration of of something that is going to take place, that people are excited about the beginning stages. And you've experienced disproportionate celebration, I'm sure. When someone has done just a a small gesture of kindness to you in the way that it may fill up your heart, you may cry, you may rejoice, you may hug them, you may embrace them, you celebrate because of something so small. And someone may sit back and say, well, I mean, I didn't really do much, right? But there's a celebration in in the inside of people as their hearts rejoice over something being done for them. And I know that you've experienced that before. But the lesson that we learn in this, the the bottom line, if you will, of all of this is very simple. If you do little things like they are big things, God will do big things like they're little things. If you're faithful in the small things like they're big things, then you know and your God promises that he will work. He will work and he will do big things in your life as though they are little things. And I know that we've seen this to be true. I I believe that this is true in our lives. I believe that God's promises are true. And I believe that, that what we're learning in this is to be faithful in these little things. And the reason, again, another real, you know, kind of solid bottom line to this, this message today is that how you do anything is an indicator of how you'll do everything. Now, we don't always look at it that way because we know our intention. We know what we intend to do, even though if we don't follow through with it. But the truth is, how you do anything, even in the small things in life, is how you will do everything. And if you will give your energy, your time, your resources, your talent, your treasure, all that God has blessed you with and given to you and that he's gifted to you in Christ, this is important, that even in the small things, they become big things. And they are an example of how you'll do anything. But again, this isn't just something that I'm telling you, right? This is biblical. This is God who's already stated this in Jesus, who has already taught this almost 2,000 years ago. In fact, in Luke, um, he records Jesus's words. And Luke did, you know, an investigation and interviews with people about Jesus. And he said that Jesus once said this, if you are faithful in little things, then you will be faithful in large things. How you do anything is an indicator of how you'll do everything. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest even with greater things. Jesus said that's the example. With whatever you've been given, you live with it, you work it, you use it to glorify God. You be faithful in the small things, and God will show up and do big things like they're small things. One of the things that that I teach sometimes in premarital counseling and with uh, young people especially, because this is is something that uh, is very important, that as they uh, come to a place where they meet somebody and they fall in love, you know how it goes, and they want to stand on a, a platform at some point in their life and make a promise to somebody else about their future and about, you know, their life together and about this thing of marriage and, and living life together as one with someone else. And I always tell them that it's great that you want to stand on a platform and you feel all lovey-dovey and you want to make a promise. But the truth is, the past is a better indicator of the future than a promise that you will ever make, than any promise that you'll ever make. And what do I mean by that? Well, our track record precedes us, doesn't it? And what our habits are from our past, as we've already talked about in this series, they will make their way into our future because if we don't stop those bad habits and replace them with good habits, then those bad habits find a way of smuggling themselves because we wouldn't intend for them to, but they find a way of smuggling themselves into our future. And no matter what the promise is that we've made, you know better than I know yourself, you've made all sorts of promises that you haven't been able to keep. Why? Because the past and our behavior and our habits is a better indicator than our promises. 
So why this series is important and why what we're about to talk about is important because God says, I want to change your past. I want to flip that script. I want to change the way you do things and better habits and following the example of Jesus because in doing so, that becomes part of your past, your, your, your recent past, which becomes part of your present, which ultimately is going to impact your future as you bring those good things into the future with you that are in alignment with your promises that you are wanting to make. And the reason we read through Scripture is because it's supposed to change us. And if we walk into our gathering together on Sunday mornings and we hear the word and hear the truth and then we make our way out and we are no different than when we came in or we have no greater awareness of the truth or any kind of conviction to change, then we're missing the point of Scripture. We're missing the point of Jesus' words. So what I want to do for for the time that we have remaining is I want to take a deep dive into a story that Jesus tells, another parable that he tells with the intent, the reason he told his followers this, his disciples and the crowds, is because it was supposed to produce change in their life, to get them to see differently so that they would be faithful in everything in life. Here's the story that Jesus teaches. (coughs) Now this story comes along after Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem towards the end of his life. As he's leaving the temple mounts, his disciples stop him and begin asking him questions. And so he pauses to tell them another story. And it says, again, Jesus tells them the kingdom of heaven, which is what Jesus taught. He wanted people to understand the kingdom of heaven and what God intended for us to do and how we should be living. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. And we know now, looking back at this story, and maybe they didn't know at the time, but this is a a message about Jesus. This is a message about our heavenly father. Who, of course, would be going on a long trip. He would be going away as he would tell the disciples, but I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you are to live with this mission and this message that you are to give to the world, and one day I will come back. But during that time, I'm entrusting you with these things to complete what I started. Jesus goes on, and he says, here's what happened. He gave five bags of silver to one man, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities, he then left on his trip. Now, you've got to understand this part of the story because this is where it really makes sense. Before the master left, he surveyed his servants. And he said, based on their proportion of their abilities, right, he gave them what he knew they could handle and what he knew that they could be entrusted with to be successful. And not everybody received the same thing. Not everybody's ready to receive the same thing or the same portions. But the master knew exactly what his servants could handle and he gave them exactly what they needed. He entrusted them because he knew their abilities God knows your abilities. God knows what you can be trusted with. He knows what you can be faithful with. We make a lot of excuses, right? And we're going to see in this story that excuses get us nowhere, that we're to be faithful with the things that God gives to us. The story continues, verse 19. These men went out, and of course, (coughs) the man with five bags, he went out and invested his money and gained five more. And the man with two bags went out and invested his money, gained two more. And the man with one bag, well, he didn't do so well. He went out into a field, dug a hole, and put the money in it. I don't know what really was on his mind at the time. We, we get a glimpse of it in a moment, but could you imagine what he was thinking in the moment? If he's seeing these other guys going out and investing and doing, he chose to do nothing. And after a long time, and it is a long, unspecified amount of time, just like it is with Jesus, their master returned from his trip, just like he promised he would, and he called them to give an account of how they had used whose money? That's right. They were stewards of this. How did you manage what I have given to you? How did you respond in this? Here's what we learn, verse 21 We learn that the one who gained five, he comes before the master and says, I've gained you five more. And the one who had two, I've gained you two more. And this is how the master responded to them. He said, well done, my good and faithful servants. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. Think about a master, probably with a kingdom, right? He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he gave ten bags of silver, or five bags of silver, two bags of silver, and one. This, this eight bags of silver was probably small in comparison to the entire kingdom, right? 
But he celebrated and said, because of this small amount, you have been faithful. So now I will give you many more responsibilities, bigger things, larger things. And I love this. Let's celebrate together. Let's celebrate your accomplishments together. This is the uh, outcome that we hope to achieve. Amen? This is what we want to hear about our lives. And this is what Jesus is trying to say. This is what you want to hear. This is what you are trying to achieve. You want to live in such a way that the master says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. But to the one, of course, that uh, wasn't faithful, the story goes on. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, and, and, and it strikes me, because anytime you would approach your master, I would assume that the master gets to speak first. That's just, you know, the way I would look at it. But it seems like as soon as he approaches his master, he says, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. That's not really a good way to start a conversation, is it? I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. He goes on to say, and I was afraid. I was afraid that I would lose your money. I feared you that I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. I didn't lose anything. At least I didn't lose it, right? Aren't you proud that I didn't lose it? I mean, there was a risk. But I was safe. The master, however, doesn't respond so kindly to this. And I believe, <coughs> excuse me, what's behind the master's response is the question about, well, did you really believe? Did you really believe that I was a harsh man? Did you, did you really fear me in knowing that, that I don't plant and I don't cultivate, but I harvest? Do you really believe that about me? Because if you did, right, wouldn't you have done something about it? Wouldn't it have compelled you to do something different than just playing it safe? I mean, couldn't you tell I entrusted this to you? Here's his response. The master replied, you wicked and you lazy servant. <laughs> but, but I didn't mean to be wicked. I mean, what, what do you mean in wicked? I, I, was, I was protecting what you gave me. And he says, yeah, but that's not what I asked you to do. I entrusted this to you. You wicked and you lazy servant, if you knew, like if you really believed that I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, he goes on and he says, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? Wouldn't that have been the smarter choice? I mean, at least, the least you could have done is put it in a bank and allowed it to draw interest. But, but you dug a hole and you hid it in a field I mean, somebody could have come by and taken it at that. That seems pretty risky to me. The least you could have done is gotten some interest off of it. And so then here's how the master goes on to respond. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant, this servant, the one who had only one, and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. And the master explains his, his, uh, his actions here. He says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given to them, and they will have an abundance. I've been able to trust this guy. He, he believed me. He actually really did fear me. You, on the other hand, man with one bag of silver, you were concerned only about yourself. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as I read that story, I couldn't help but begin to think of that bottom line that how you do anything is a better indicator of how you'll do everything. And Jesus is teaching through this parable that the master has entrusted his servants, that's us, with a stewardship that is based on the proportion of our abilities that he himself has given to us through his spirit. And he says, I want you to live in such a way with what I've entrusted you that it will multiply and it will grow. Don't hide it. Who takes a light and puts a bowl over top of it, Jesus would teach, right? Who covers that light? But instead, no, you put it on a stand and you hold it up high so that it brings light to the whole house. How you do anything is an indicator of how you'll do everything. 
So it brought out about a question, right? And I want you to think about this question for a minute. How are you handling the little things? Take an honest evaluation. How are you, how am I, I mean, this is a question for me as well. How are we handling the little things in life? When it comes to your own spiritual walk and relationship with Christ, how are you handling the little things? How are you handling your prayer life? How are you handling your study time and your meditation time on Scripture? Are you spending more time seeking truth in social media than you do seeking truth in Scripture? We, we kind of made a, a joke during the podcast this week about spending more time on Facebook rather than our face in the book. Spending more time on social media seeking, you know, whatever type of fulfillment that we're looking for and that we're trying to find information. But Scripture is where you find your identity, right, in Christ. You learn about it and you grow from it and it's sitting there and we have it on every device known to man right now. It is the most uh, acceptable, the most, uh, way to say that, uh, accessible thing that you can find on this planet. You can find Scripture anywhere. We own Bibles multitude of them. Are we being faithful in the small things? In your marriage, are you being faithful in the small things? How are you handling the little things? How are you handling the encouragement of your spouse and their heart that you now have, have such influence on? How are you handling the little things in your career in your health, maybe in, in your finances, may, maybe it's in your parenting. How are you handling the little things? The nighttime checks, you know, on that heart condition. I love those moments of just talking to my son and talking to my daughter and just saying, how's your heart? How do you feel? Do you feel safe? Do, do you feel loved? Do you feel beautiful? Do you feel strong? Do you feel courageous? Do you feel smart? And to encourage them, how are you handling the little things in life? Because Jesus continues in this story. And he says that this story has a major implication on our life. That it's not just a parable, but in fact, this is how it's going to be later on when all things, as Marshall says, when that day comes and we stand before our, our Heavenly Father and before our Savior Jesus, there is something that will take place that ties in with all of this. And he says the master will come and he will separate the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. He put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Why are you blessed and favored by my father? Because you've been faithful. And because you've been faithful and because I want to bless you, then you will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Even before the foundations of the world were laid, God had a plan God was already celebrating. He was already rejoicing. He already knew what he wanted to accomplish for you out of his love for you. The story continues. Jesus says, the king looks at the people. You're going to inherit this. You, you are considered blessed because for I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. And he continues. He says, I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous, this group, are going to go, wait a minute. We did what? Well, when did we, I love this, when did we ever see you? Master, King, God, when did we ever see you? I mean, I remember that I fed somebody, but I mean, when, was it, when, when did we see you? When were you hungry and feed you? When were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to visit you? <laughs> and the Master tells them, the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, then you were doing it to, say this, me. When I gave a cup of water to someone who was thirsty, 
I was doing that for you. When I gave somebody a piece of clothing, I was doing that for you. I mean, that, that was you. <laughs> this is where we get the disproportionate celebration. You may think that it had nothing to do with anything. You may think that it was just a cup of water, that it was just a visit, that it was just a smile, that it was just a meal, that it was just being kind. And your heavenly father says, no, you don't understand. When you did that little thing, I was rejoicing. You were doing that for me. The creator of all things, you were doing that for me. That's disproportionate celebration. It seems like something so small. But remember what God told Zerubbabel and the people of Israel. Do not despise small beginnings. Because that's where a kite string becomes a suspension bridge that has so many blessings that have come along with it and, and major change in that area with commerce and trade and all sorts of things. I mean, imagine how much of an impact that's had in that region and with business and with people's lives. <laughs> Don't despise small beginnings because if you do little things like they are big things, your heavenly Father will show up and do big things like they are little things. And I think this is why the Apostle Paul, when he's writing his letters in the New Testament, I think all of this is in his mind. I really do. I think he gets this. He understands this. This is why when he writes to us about the way we conduct ourselves each and every day as we work, as we labor, as we live our lives, this is what he says. Work willingly. And that's a really... Bad translation for us in modern times because the word willing means, well, I, I'm, I mean, I can do it, right? Well, I'm willing to. I, I'll do it if I need to. That's kind of the way we look at willing. Being willing, well, yeah, I'm available. But when you look at this word willingly in the way that it is actually translated, it means with the in, your entire being. It's actually translated with your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength wholeheartedly with every part of your very existence work with this part of you at whatever you do. Whatever means whatever, right? Anything, everything, because it's all an indicator as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Why? He continues. And he says, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance, just like Jesus taught in the parable that the king would say, come and receive the inheritance I've prepared for you as you live your life and as you work and you labor in the small things, in the mundane things, in the little things of life. Remember that you'll receive an inheritance as your reward and that the master, that the king that you are serving is Christ. So the question we're left with, the question we're left to wrestle with and that we really should as we leave here today and throughout this week, in what areas of life do you need to fly the kite? And my prayer for you this week is that you would take the story of Jesus you would take Paul's urging there in Colossians and you would think about this question, in what areas of life do you need to fly the kite? Do you need to pay attention to the little things? And then my prayer for you is that you would take a step. That if it's in your spiritual life, you would take a step in your walk with Jesus and you would pay attention to the little things, to your prayer time, to your study time, to your service to other people. Because now you know, even in those small things, you are serving your heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, in your marriage, I pray that you'll, you'll pay attention to the little things. Pay attention to the small moments and the small details of time that you spend together. Maybe it's your prayer together. Maybe it's your study time together or serving together as a couple, parenting your children as a couple. Don't despise small beginnings. Don't take them for granted. Maybe it's in your health or your career, your financial situation, your friendships, whatever it may be. In what area of life do you need to fly the kite? And then the answer is to fly it, to take those steps in that direction, to do something about it. And when you do, your heavenly Father promises 
And if you'll do those little things like they are big things, then he will show up and do big things like they're little things. Amen? Let's fly the kite together. Let's do this. Let's commit ourselves to this because we know that in flying the kite, it will help us win the day. It'll help us to live a life that glorifies our Heavenly Father in following our Savior, Jesus. And if you've got a step that you'd like to take today, maybe you're here and you want to talk about it, we would love to talk with you further about it. Or maybe if you're online, reach out to us, email us, let us know through social media. We would love to speak with you further as well. Well, that's all I got this morning. Let's fly the kite. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you this morning for your message and for your goodness. I thank you for being here, for being back, for being able to speak your word, for being able to share your truth. And Father, I pray a prayer of thanksgiving to you and a thanksgiving to this church and to this community, to people in our community. Father, I pray for healing and comfort in their lives as they face so many things. Father, I pray for the opportunity for our church, for each of us individually to be able to be a light in our community and a light into the various lives of the people in our spheres of influence that we can help them come to know who you are and that maybe, Father, today we will choose with all of our might to work willingly for you, that we'll fly the kite because we know that if we're faithful, Father, if we're faithful in the little things, you are faithful in all things and you'll come through. So, Lord, I pray that you give us the wisdom to know what to do. Give us the humility to want to do it. And give us the courage to get it done. And we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you have any questions at all or want to talk about anything you've seen or heard in today's message or maybe want to know more about the worship or maybe about how to have a relationship with Jesus, we would love to speak with you further. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you.